Hello. Thank you for coming to learn about guiding children through climate change. I'm Melissa Kelly, an elementary lead guide and teacher educator. I'm also the parent of a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old. I've been in the classroom for about 12 years now. And in that time, I've noticed that children have come in more and more concerned about climate change. But I've also noticed that they have a marked advantage in understanding the answers to those questions because of the cosmic curriculum. Dr. Montessori introduced it about a hundred years ago, and we've actually been teaching climate change all along. When we hear those words, climate change, that can bring up some big, daunting ideas. So before we dive in, let's just brainstorm everything we can think of when we hear the words climate change. We'll take about a minute and just write all of those down. So maybe you thought of sea level rise or global warming or habitat loss or even hoax. It's a multifaceted concept. And the truth is, we're all going to go through this one together. We are trying to find our way just as surely as the young people who need our support. We hear the news and we can hear some pretty scary concepts like famine or drought or sea level rise, flooding, destruction. We have to stop everything that we're doing right now that doesn't inspire a very hopeful mindset. It can be a scary idea. And so we can see how many teachers wouldn't want to introduce climate change into their classrooms if it's so doom and gloom. But we're Montessorians and we're guided by two ideas, that of supernature and the cosmic task. To illustrate this, I'd like to share a story with you. A third year girl came into my classroom and she was very, very excited because another girl named Greta was leading climate strikes. And I thought, <clears throat> being the Montessori teacher I am, yes, we can get a report out of this one. And I was already starting to plan the punctuation lessons when she continued and she said, are we going to make it? I mean, are humans gonna go extinct? Well, my first instinct was to placate her, to bring her peace of mind, but I know my students, they're thinkers, and they have the advantage of having been educated through the lens of cosmic education. So I took a breath and I said, do you remember on the timeline of life when the plates moved around and the climate changed, but life adapted? Well, humans are life on this planet and will adapt too. And she looked at me very seriously and she said, but life also goes extinct on the timeline. So I took another deep breath and I said, well, remember our humans studies when we learned that humans can innovate and build and create and they come together to solve big problems. Maybe humans will come together to solve these big problems too. And she said, well, what would we need to fix? And I said, well, maybe that's where our research should begin. It's very timely. On the Earth Day Live Summit just a month ago, Dr. Christina Kwok, a fellow at the Brookings Institution, said that an education that doesn't prepare children for the changes wrought by climate change is an irrelevant education. Hearing that, I thought, wait, we, we're relevant. We have cosmic education. I have to tell the people. But then I stopped and wondered, are we really structuring our lessons in a way that teach eco-literacy? Are we effectively conveying the idea of the cosmic task? What about Dr. Montessori's concept of supernature? Do we understand that well enough to be able to convey that in our lessons and to structure them in a way that shows the children exactly what our cosmic task is? I wondered and I thought, well, maybe we need a little history lesson. Dr. Montessori said an education capable of saving humanity is no small undertaking, and that's absolutely true. So she came up with one. 
She also came up with the idea of supernature. What he makes humans great is our instinct to build and to innovate. We're curious and resourceful. She called our human-made world supernature, not that which is above or better than nature, but that which is superimposed on it. And she made a chart. So right here at the top is the sun, the life-giving source of all energy on Earth. And right below that, interconnected and dependent with it, is the natural world, the biotic and abiotic factors that all work together to make the planetary system go. Below that are all the families of humans, also interconnected with the natural world and dependent on it. But the humans are also connected to the silver sphere in the middle, the sphere of thought, the sphere of what we build. That's the human-made world. That's supernature. And humans pass that on through training and education of their young. So the human-made world looks different than the natural world. It reflects our thoughts and innovations and aspirations. Montessori also recognized that supernature was out of sync with the natural world, even as early as the 1940s. And she discussed this in some lectures that you can read in uh, her book, Education and Peace. She was also ahead of her time in so many ways, one of them being ecological literacy. She recognized long before many other scientists the ecological nature of the world and the impacts of human activity on it. She knew that all life was interconnected, as you can see in this chart, and she knew that each niche in an ecosystem was filled by an organism that would work to maintain the sustainability of that ecosystem. She called the unconscious work that an organism did in its niche its cosmic task. She recognized that humans also had a task, a niche as well, though we don't operate in a single habitat by instinct. We have tendencies, like the urge to build, that put us directly into the global ecosystem, the whole biosphere. She guessed that our task and the task of generations after us was to bring balance between the human-made world and the natural world. So she invented cosmic education. The cosmic curriculum is a spiraling, interconnected sequence of lessons in science, geography, history, and culture that repeat year after year at an increasing level of complexity. They began as concrete, impressionistic experiences for the young children in the environment that progressed to more abstract, complex ideas as the children age. Okay, history lesson over. So what are our key takeaways for today? The first one is intentional planning within the cosmic curriculum with the understanding of supernature and the cosmic task. We're going to ask guiding questions that scaffold our planning and key experiences within the cosmic curriculum to help children explore nature, supernature, and their cosmic task. That requires some inquiry on our part. And in a few moments, we're going to find out what our guiding questions are. The second one is to keep it cosmic. This one is not so easy. We're so pressed to get in those math and language lessons that sometimes they can become the entire focus of what we do. We can lose sight of the cosmic curriculum. So we'll need to refocus on lessons that bring foundational understanding of the whole world to the children if we are going to teach from a lens of ecological literacy. History and culture and science and geography will be the web from which we pluck those lessons with the understanding that math and language are the tools and they're necessary to understand, to build, and to pass on supernature. It all works together. The third takeaway will be to provide the correct level of experience because we don't want to give too much too soon, but we also want to provide enough to support valorization of the older children as they age into their teenage years. Just for a moment, think of some guiding questions that you might have. They could be something like, beyond arithmetic and language, what do you want children to know when they leave your classroom? Or they can be something like, how will you prepare children for the changing world?
Just for a moment, write down a few of your questions and any others that you can think of. Now you don't have to answer those questions right now. And we're gonna ask a few more today. The first one being skills. What knowledge and skills do people need to face a changing world as the climate changes? The second one is ecological literacy. How will we present eco ecological literacy so that the children become adults who get it and understand the science behind their changing world and the systems in it? The third question is a question of character. What character traits will people need to operate in a new normal? Do we want to see our former students reaching out to help others? Perhaps they can be resilient and navigate the new world. The last one is our end goal. What is the ultimate goal of an education in the time of climate change? Is it just basic academic skills or does it need to be something more? Once we decide our guiding questions, we can begin to implement them in our planning. We can choose key experiences within the cosmic curriculum that children will receive to give them the knowledge that they need. The last element that we'll need is knowledge of how much to give at each level. At the lower elementary level, that's grades one through three, the lessons are impressionistic and concrete. We're just building a strong foundation of knowledge and experience that will create a database that the children can pull from later. At the upper elementary level, grades four through six, we can give more details. The children become more aware of life outside of family, friends, and school, and the lessons can become more specialized. We can mention climate change and pollution at this age. We can delve into issues of social justice and equity. As the children begin to find their place in the changing world, we can say, what do you notice? As they enter grades seven through nine at the adolescent level, we can accompany lessons with a call to action. What will you do? What change will you make? How will you improve anything you don't like in what you see? There are a few key areas we can also use for teaching eco-literacy. These fall under the categories of history, geography and science, and culture. These three categories provide so much understanding of the planet, its systems, the biosphere, the nature of life, and human culture. To understand our cosmic task, we have to have a firm foundation in these areas. Luckily, the cosmic curriculum has been giving this to us for a long time. The lessons I'm going to mention in these areas are elementary specific. So if you don't know any of those lessons or the order to present them in, a great book to follow this on with is Children of the Universe by Daniil and Michael Duffy. They'll mention the lessons in the exact order that I'm going to present them. We start out the beginning of each year with our great lessons. There are a few key takeaways from the great lessons that we can hit each time that we give them. The first one for the first lesson being the cosmic task. When we give the great lesson, we can make certain, if we're a traditionalist, that we say, I obey. And if we're teaching in a more secular setting, we can say, Today, as it was millions of years ago, the laws of the universe are followed in the same way. And by completing our tasks and following our laws, we who are connected to the universe can also feel connected to each other. And so we've hit the cosmic task. In the second lesson, the coming of life, we can make sure that the children know that life always adapts. It always finds a way to come back after an extinction event. It's always changing. In the third story, The Coming of Humans, we emphasize the awesome tendency of humans to inquire, to create, to build, and to love. 
Note 3a, coming off of the story of humans. This is the fundamental need of humans. It can use that story as a jumping off point to demonstrate that humans use their amazing abilities to fulfill their needs, since that directly applies to supernature. The fourth and fifth stories of math and language open the door to tools that humans use to understand their world, build on top of it, and then pass it on to future generations. As children age into adolescence, they can reference back to these stories and use them as a touchstone. Next, usually after the coming of life, we teach the timeline of life. It links geology, geography, climatology, and biology together. At the lower elementary level, the key experiences with this lesson are connecting extinction events to climate change, showing how life adapts and how it always comes back after an extinction event. At the upper elementary level, we can add more details. We can add in discussions of plate tectonics, or we can talk about the causes for climate change, like the connection between the level of carbon in the atmosphere and temperature rise. We can talk about continental drift and how that applies to climate change, and we can also introduce the current extinction event, the Anthropocene. At the adolescent level, we can reference back to the timeline of life with a targeted vertical study of one event from deep time, like the Permian extinction, or the Pliocene Ice Age, or the Eocene Thermal Maximum. This is the chart. Of fundamental needs. It follows the story of humans. We introduce the commonalities amongst all humans, that we have all the same needs across time and place. We usually introduce this at the lower elementary level, and the focus of the key experience at this level is our commonalities. At the upper elementary level, we can study how one specific culture fulfilled its needs and we can compare cultures across time or place to see how they're connected. We can also discuss how human, human society was changed by climate change, like during the ice ages, or how warming affected the development of agriculture and how we fulfilled our needs for food differently afterwards. At the adolescent level, we have the opportunity to talk about what happens when people's needs aren't fulfilled. We can talk about equity and social justice. We can also examine large civilizations and the climactic forces that led to conflict, like the Maya or the Khmer or the ancestral Puebloan or the Romans or even modern day Syria. Connected to the study of fundamental needs is the study of economic geography. Key experiences at this level, at all levels, need to go back always to innovators and problem solvers. There are amazing makers and inventions like waterless toilets or green roofs or solar generators or hydrostatic nets. We create an atmosphere of awe and respect and honor for the people who are working to solve these big problems, but we also want to let the children know that they're not the exception. They're the norm, and they're just like them. At the lower elementary level, we want the children to understand that the entire world is interconnected, that humans work together to make the products that we use, that humans help each other. At the upper elementary level, we can follow the product, just one chosen product, and we can learn how absolutely many people come together to make that one item. At the adolescent level, we can examine the social and environmental impact of the items that we use every day, like chocolate, or cell phones, or palm oil, or plastic bottles. So those are the biggies, but for them to be effective, we also have to have key experiences in other areas, and those are ecology of place, system study, social justice, and opportunities for civic engagement. When we think of ecology of place, we have to think about where we are in space. If you think about the land you inhabit, or the animals around you, or where your water comes from, you're practicing ecology of place. Nature should always be the bedrock upon which you build with the children. Even if it's just a dandelion growing up through the cracks of the sidewalk, you can use that. That is an ecosystem in itself, and it's part of a larger system. If you have 
access to a balcony or a porch or a yard, you can build a garden. Even a potted plant will do. The children can have the opportunity to observe life right in their own areas. You can go on nature walks. You could study your energy use. You could practice conservation. The children can identify local plants or they can record bird song and research it later. They can also watch and identify bugs and you can model how to care for them. They need models of how to care for the natural world even bugs. You could learn about your local water sources. You can study the little habitats all around you like a fallen log or a hula hoop's worth of tall grass. You can find out if there's fungus there or maybe there are bacteria in the soil. You could compare the ecosystem of a parking lot to one that's green. That's always a fun experience. The children will also need to understand that the world is a system and that systems make up that system. And that looks different at every single level. At the lower elementary, system study is concrete and interconnected. You can give the work of air and work of water lessons. You can explain what an atom is and let children explore the chart of elements. Make compost to study the carbon cycle. You can supplement that with a study of soil layers and types. And if you're not squeamish, you can make a worm composting bin. Ensure that you teach the parts and organs of animals and the basic parts of plants. Make sure that you give the climate zones lessons and the biomes lessons at this age. Let them have experiences in a natural space and let them garden. At the upper elementary level, this is where the building can happen. There are so many lessons that you can give at this age and the children just seem to really get system study. This is the best level uh, for teaching pH, acid rain, density of salt water versus fresh water, watersheds, aquifers, water erosion. This is the level to teach air pressure and the jet stream and that connection to weather systems. You can show them the greenhouse effect and its life-giving qualities and why we actually need it. You can teach them about what a molecule is and show them water and hydrogen, carbon dioxide, sulfur, methane, and nitrogen specifically. You can direct teach the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, and you can ask them to notice what happens when human activity interrupts those cycles. You can teach biosphere, biomes, habitats, niches. You can look at trophic pyramids and food webs and keystone species and you can ask the children what happens when a species is removed from a system. You can deliberately introduce questions of pollution at this age and ask the children what they notice about it. They can research human activity in relation to atmospheric and geologic change. At the adolescent level, systems focus more on uh, synthesis. Like how does glacier melt affect the thermal haline system and how does that change the climate around the world? What is the relationship between human activity, climate change, and social equity? What sustainable economic systems can you think of? Maybe have them try out a circular economy. What other systems can they pinpoint or practice? Can they practice arcology, the combination of architecture and ecology? What do they notice about the world that they would like to fix? Maybe they can focus on fixing problems of things that they don't like. Either way, at any age, the children are going to notice that climate change is an issue of social justice. If they've had the, the experiences previously discussed, they're gonna come to note that habitat loss can cause extinction that famine, drought, and sea level rise will lead to migration, that sometimes migration can lead to nationalism, and that that can lead to conflict. And they're going to want to reach out to help. We have to support them and give them opportunities to do that by letting them practice civic engagement. Civic engagement really falls into two categories. The student-led activities that can be done anytime after an introductory lesson and the guided opportunities in which the adult takes the lead. 
Student-led opportunities are usually things like letter writing campaigns or setting up litter-free lunches or recycling programs or conservation programs in their local area. They can set up fundraisers for the World Wildlife Federation or the Arbor Foundation, Heifer International or the Center for Biodiversity. Those guided opportunities are a little bit bigger and they require adult help. Those are things like Montessori Model UN or UNICEF's Youth for Climate Action Workshops, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, Project Wild Films, or even joining the Children in Nature Network workshops, which usually happen during those teen years. So let's review our key takeaways from today. The first one is intentional planning. With a better understanding of Dr. Montessori's concept of supernature and the cosmic task, we can order our lessons in a way that they scaffold children's understanding of the planet that they live on and the global civilization that they're going to inherit. We can practice intentional planning. We have to prepare the children for the world that they're going to live in. We can't find peace any longer just teaching traditional academics. Dr. Montessori understood this a hundred years ago, and we need to heed her call now. When we plan each lesson sequence through the lens of cosmic education and the cosmic task, we can consciously do it in a way that specifically nudges children toward an awareness of global systems. If we plan with that end goal in mind, specifically the understanding that our generation and generations after us will need to bring balance back between the human-made world and the natural world, then those familiar lessons arrange themselves in a beautiful, logical way. Over the course of about 10 years, the cosmic curriculum can help children to comprehend what they're experiencing as the world changes and take the lead in making the difference as long as we've provided the correct level of experiences at the right time. Here are some extra resources for pre-made curricula for you if you'd like to supplement the cosmic curriculum. You can go ahead and take a screenshot of those if you'd like. And here are some sources for you. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about guiding children through climate change using the, the cosmic curriculum. Thank you.